All right. So Dr. Kelly Smart is an independent scientist at the CAMH Brain Health Imaging Center and an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry, University of Toronto. Dr. Smart completed an MSc in pharmacology at the University of Toronto and a PhD in neuroscience at McGill University. She then conducted postdoctoral research on pet imaging applications in psychiatry at the Yale School of Medicine. At CAMH, Dr. Smart's research uses molecular imaging of synaptic markers and neurotransmission together with MRI, behavior, and drug probes to understand the mechanisms of disease, drug, and treatment-related changes in brain function. She also works as core faculty within the BHIC imaging methodology team to develop and validate analysis methods for new pet radio tracers. Dr. Smart, please go ahead. Right. Thanks very much, Sophie. Um, so thanks for inviting me to speak today. Um, so I'm going to uh, go over some research I've done on studying molecular uh, mechanisms of synaptic plasticity and molecular markers in the brain using PET. So just by way of intro really broadly, uh, my research focuses on new methods for PET imaging, including new radio tracers and analysis methods, uh, and then applying that to understand disease mechanisms in psychiatry. So I'm gonna cover uh, quite a few distinct studies, but I'm gonna try to give a relatively cohesive talk and um, kind of think through some of the issues this work has raised for me on both the brain science and the methodological sides. So I'm gonna start with a brief intro to quantitative brain PET and then talk about some studies I've run to look at uh, synaptic plasticity in humans and then um, get into some thoughts about how we integrate PET signals with uh, more systems neuroscience measures uh, at a practical level. So starting with kind of PET 101. Um, so PET imaging uses radio tracers, which are purpose-built drugs synthesized with a radioactive tag and designed to enter the brain and bind to a specific protein target, uh, often a receptor in the brain. Pardon me, Kelly, we can't see your slides. Oh, no. Oh, right, of course. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, you see the slideshow? There we go. Okay, All right, sorry, looks that. great. All right, that's, so this will be a little easier to follow, I think. Um, but these were the first visual aids, so I think we're okay. Okay, so here's our radio tracer with its uh, radioactive tag and its uh, receptor site in the brain. So we administer the radio tracer to the participant. It travels to the brain while that isotope decays and releases two photons diametrically opposed to each other. Uh, so our PET camera picks up those uh, coincident radiation events, and then that gives us a line of response uh, where we can tell the signal originated from in the brain. So over the course of an hour or two, as we pick up hundreds of thousands or millions of those signals, uh, we can start to slowly build up a picture of where in the brain our radio tracer is and so where our target is. Uh, so at the kind of broadest level, it's analogous to something like a Western blot or um, immunocytochemistry where we're quantifying a protein by giving it a label we can measure. But the big difference here is that we can't just wash our system with our tracer, occupy every binding site and then count it all up. Uh, because these are drugs and these are living participants. And so we would have to give really massive doses of a, an active drug to do that. So instead what we do is administer a really tiny dose and then track the radio tracer over time as it enters and leaves the brain. So then with these data, we can use its kinetics instead of the absolute quantity of radioactive signal and fit our data to mathematical models that use a kind of classic understanding of receptor ligand interactions to get protein measurements in absolute physical units. So none of those details are very important for this talk. You can just remember that BT and BPND are, are measures of target availability. Uh, but I think it is helpful to keep in mind what we're actually doing here. Okay, so on to some neuroscience. 
So I'm first going to talk about a few different strategies for trying to measure synaptic plasticity, either directly, meaning measuring actual changes at synapses, or by measuring proteins that are really important for plasticity. So here's a synapse with a few of the proteins we might be interested in. Uh, we're going to start with MUR5, the uh, blue one here at the postsynaptic side. So these are metabotropic glutamate receptors that are expressed postsynaptically at uh, most glutamate synapses in the brain. Um, they're expressed everywhere apart from the cerebellum. And they've been shown in studies using electrophysiology or behavior to be really important for modulating strength of signaling through synapses. So they're necessary in a few different pathways of long-term potentiation or depression, and they can directly modulate an MDA receptor firing rate. So MGORA5 is a good candidate for a kind of plasticity marker, at least at glutamate synapses. And the PET tracers we use to measure this are ABP and FPEB, which are very similar, just different uh, isotope tags. And we're um, bringing up FPEB at CAMH right now. So MGORA5 imaging could be a way to understand synaptic plasticity or capacity for plasticity. It's a, a good candidate for linking brain changes to changing behavior. So in my PhD work, I wanted to test this by linking MGOR5 to a brain plasticity process that's pretty well understood in humans. So we decided to use psychostimulant sensitization. Um, so this is uh, a paradigm that's very well characterized in rodents, uh, especially where repeated exposure to a stimulant drug like cocaine or amphetamine will cause a stronger behavioral response every time the animal is exposed to this. Uh, and alongside this, it's been shown that uh, repeated exposure to these drugs also increases the dopamine response to the drug. So that gets stronger and stronger over time, which is what's shown in the plot on the right. Um, so this is really well studied in rodents because it was thought for a long time to potentially be a way to model some of the early brain changes that might uh, lead to addiction. And because it's this process that's induced by repeated drug exposure and induces a really specific change in dopamine systems that we know are important for that. Um, it's also been demonstrated in humans. So you see both behavioral sensitization and stronger dopamine response with PET in humans who are um, exposed to repeated doses of a stimulant drug. Um, and there's also good evidence that MGOR5 is important in some related processes. So MGOR5 is uh, important for especially drug-related learning. So things like learning to associate a cue with a drug or to extinguish that association. A lot of that relies on or is, um, is helped along by MGOR5. So we thought that this might be a candidate process where MGOR5 mediated plasticity is playing an important role in other changes going on in the brain that cause changes in behavior. So we wanted to use psychostimulant sensitization to probe MGOR5 as a measure of plasticity. And we hypothesized that higher MGOR5 uh, might be seen in people after sensitization. Uh, so this hadn't been studied in uh, animals, but we decided to skip straight to humans anyways. Uh, so this was a study done in healthy people who were randomized to receive four doses of either placebo or dexedrin, so dextroamphetamine. And then they had an MGOR5 PET scan at baseline uh, and then after three doses of the drug. So they got the PET scan and then a dose of the drug and we measured their behavior to be able to track sensitization. Uh, they had three sessions with the pill and behavior. And then they came back for a follow-up PET scan to see if MGOR5 levels had changed in their brain. And then we gave them the drug one last time uh, just to measure sensitization itself, make sure we were studying the process we thought we were. So starting with behavior, uh, we did see behavioral sensitization in these people. So this is the placebo group kind of grayed out on the left and then the amphetamine group in blue. So we see increases in these kind of activating or energizing uh, subjective effects of the drug compared to placebo and then at the later dose compared to the first dose. And we could measure this a little more objectively by tracking their speech rate. So people on amphetamine talk faster than people taking placebo. And this, uh, this effect is stronger at the later dose compared to the earlier dose. When we looked at our brain measure, measured MGOR5 in the brain, we really saw no evidence of a change. So we looked in a few likely regions in dorsal and ventral striatum and in prefrontal cortex. Uh, 
And in both the placebo and the amphetamine groups, there was really no hint of any change in MGOR5 availability. Um, because we had skipped uh, animals in this study, uh, and because this is a much more well-characterized and probably a more robust uh, protocol in rodents, we went back and did those experiments in parallel just to make sure that it wasn't um, something that we were missing because our sensitization protocol isn't strong enough in humans or something. So we gave mice uh, four doses of amphetamine and saw behavioral sensitization there. And then we quantified MGOR5 in vivo, sorry, in, uh, in vitro postmortem in these animals. And we saw the same thing, that there was no change in MGOR5 in mice that had been given amphetamine versus mice that had just been given saline. <coughs> But one thing we did find, which uh, we didn't expect to, was that people who had lower MGOR5 at baseline, uh, so these people here, were the ones who tended to show a larger subsequent behavioral change. So greater sensitization in the people who had lower MGOR5 before they got any drug. Uh, this seemed to hold true in the animals too. Low MGOR5 was linked to a stronger tendency towards sensitization which is again a phenotype that's been linked to addiction susceptibility. So this suggests that low MGOR5 might be associated with um, a greater tendency towards sensitization and potentially towards uh, addiction susceptibility. Although MGOR5 changes weren't a major or at least an early correlate of sensitization itself. So we didn't see a change in MGOR5, but we saw a relationship between this marker and um, susceptibility to this phenotype. Uh, so this second point here is pretty speculative, but interestingly, at the same time I was doing that study, uh, a colleague, Sylvia Cox in Mark Layton's lab was running a cohort study that was looking at teenagers who were at high risk for substance use disorders based on genetic and personality factors. And this work found uh, what I think is a convergent result uh, where people who are at high risk for later developing substance use disorders uh, which we might consider to be the people who are also uh, more susceptible to developing sensitization, uh, had lower MGOR5. So it was a little bit complicated. This interacted with the cannabis effect, but it seemed to be pointing in the same direction, that low MGOR5 was linked to this risk for developing addiction. Um, so we know that MGOR5 is a functionally important receptor for regulating synaptic activity and strength. We didn't see any changes that accompanied sensitization, um, but we saw again this baseline link, which we might speculate is related to something like capacity for synaptic remodeling. I can imagine a scenario where it's uh, adaptive to be um, more flexible in response to uh, environmental stimuli. So more able to adapt your behavior might be um, protective against kind of getting stuck on a, a kind of compulsive drug use track. But of course, that's all speculative. Um, but from this experiment, we kind of wondered if we were looking at the right thing, because we know that MGOR5 is really important functionally for plasticity. But that doesn't necessarily mean that, um, that we need to see changes in MGOR5 in plasticity. It might still be doing its thing, promoting plasticity, without having to see a change in its own availability. So we were, or I was interested in looking into markers for kind of not the causes of plasticity, but the effects, the actual outcome of um, changes in the brain that affect behavior. So one candidate for this is the uh, protein SV2A, which is a vesicular protein that's present on synaptic vesicles basically everywhere in the brain. Uh, so SV2A is here. It's a protein that's involved in mediating vesicle release. It's present essentially on every synapse in the brain and at pretty constant levels. So the same number of SV2A on every vesicle and vesicle number itself is pretty tightly regulated at synapses. So uh, it's been validated to be an in vivo marker of synaptic density. So uh, in vivo SV2A signal is well correlated with uh, ex vivo markers of synapses, including the kind of canonical one, synaptobicin. So we have this way to measure uh, synaptic density directly in people in vivo. Our pet tracers for this are UCBJ and SYNVEST. Again, very similar molecules with different isotope markers. And SYNVEST is the one we're bringing up at CAMH. Um, but there was kind of one 
important outstanding question here to me, which is that we have this uh, protein that's a really solid marker for um, for synaptic vesicles, but it's an active protein. Like it's actively involved in the vesicle release process, interacting with calcium ions and other proteins. Um, so we wondered if those processes might affect our PET signal. Basically, as a vesicle is going through the highly mediated process of releasing its contents, the binding site that we're trying to target on SVTLA might be more or less available for binding. So that means that activity in the brain might affect uh, our synaptic density signal, not just kind of static synaptic density. So I designed an experiment to test this using a classic visual stimulation checkerboard study. So you can do this in PET, just like in fMRI, but it required a few changes. Uh, our participants needed to wear these cool video glasses because the PET scanner bore is too small for a screen or a mirror. And the stimulation needed to be sustained for an entire hour long PET scan, which we then compared to a separate baseline scan. So again, this is because PET takes an hour or more to reflect a single time point, uh, hopefully without too much physiological variation within that hour. So we worked a bit to optimize this to be able to do that. And I think we were successful. What we found was that our measures of tracer binding at SV2A, which are VT and VPND in the middle and right here, were very stable. So between the baseline and the um, activation scan in the visual cortex, we didn't see any difference um, in tracer binding. So even when we knew we were stimulating uh, visual cortex, it wasn't affecting binding of our tracer. So that's a good thing. It means that we have a stable measure of binding that's not kind of contaminated by changes in brain activity. And as kind of a check, it was nice to see that this K1 parameter, which tracks tracer uptake into the brain and is really closely related to blood flow, um, increased really, um, really substantially and specifically in visual cortex during our activation scan. So we can separate out the uptake, the increase in blood flow from the binding, which does not change. Um, so that's encouraging that we have this stable measure of synaptic density that we can use in vivo, even if you know, your participants are doing math in their head or something during the scan, it's not gonna contaminate your results. And then um, we wanted to probe into this a little bit further. So we repeated the experiment with fMRI with an adapted um, checkerboard protocol. And we found that uptake measured by K1 was really closely correlated with uptake measured by fMRI bold in the visual cortex. So we have a, a really similar change in K1. It's much larger in magnitude than fMRI, um, but it tracks it really nicely. So in theory, SV2A PET is actually giving us this kind of parallel simultaneous measure of both synaptic density as a static measure and uptake as a, a dynamic measure. So this has led to uh, some of my first work at, uh, at CAMH, where we're starting up a study now that will look at RTMS effects on synaptic density in people with depression. So together with Dan Bloomberger and the uh, Tamerly Modulation Clinic, uh, we're gonna compare synaptic density in people before and after they get a full treatment course of RTMS and see if we can measure a reversal of synapse loss in people with depression or more broadly, whether synaptic density PET can measure the kind of restructuring that we think is going on at the molecular level with a bunch of different treatments for psychiatric disorders. So obviously there's been a lot of work on this kind of thing using MRI or DTI or other functional measures, EG or TMS. Um, but I think SV2A PET offers a uniquely direct and potentially more sensitive measure of really basic changes in the machinery of the brain. Uh, so we're starting this study in a few weeks, so we'll have to wait and see how it goes. Okay, and one last thing I'll mention is that another thread of my postdoc work was in validating radio tracers for another important glutamate synapse marker and MDA receptors. Uh, so we identified a tracer that will give a reliable measure of glue N2B containing NMDA receptors specifically, uh, which again is a subtype that's especially important in regulating synaptic plasticity. So we confirmed uh, the imaging characteristics in monkeys. It's, it's um, in good shape to move into humans, easy to quantify glue and to be well. Um, and we also uh, tested whether it would be sensitive to changes in glutamate uh, using an acute ketamine challenge. 
um, and it did not seem to be. So we have another stable measure of um, kind of a synaptic activity slash plasticity marker that I think will be a really useful postsynaptic counterpart to something like SV2A. Okay, so the studies I've showed you so far each did a bit of work to try to understand our molecular markers in relation to uh, more dynamic activity or change measures. But I want to get into that question a little bit more directly and go through some of what I've been thinking of in integrating PET and MRI measures. Um, so we're going to start by revisiting MGLUR5 in this context. Uh, so a study led by one of my postdoc mentors found that MGLUR5 availability was higher during early abstinence, this is the dark gray bar here, um, in people with alcohol use disorder. So these are people with AUD compared to healthy controls in the white, and the AUD patients were scanned at one week and four weeks into supervised abstinence. So alongside the finding that I showed you earlier that low MGLUR5 might point to risk prediction in these people who have established alcohol use disorder and then withdraw from the drug, um, you see this upregulation of MGLUR5 across the brain. Um, another pretty robust characteristic of these patients is disrupted functional connectivity in the brain. So um, at resting state, people with AUD, especially during withdrawal, will show kind of changes in both directions and a general disorganization of um, resting brain function. So lower uh, activity within or connectivity between um, canonical networks, that kind of thing. So we wanted to see if we could identify how this MGUR5 effect might interact with those uh, functional activity and connectivity measures. So within this study, um, we looked at both modalities. So these are AUD patients in the inpatient monitored abstinence and getting scanned at day seven and day 28 with both um, MGLUR5 PET and resting state fMRI. And then they're compared to healthy people scanned at a single time point. Uh, so our functional connectivity measures were to look at both global functional connectivity. So uh, how at the time force correlation of each site in the brain uh, relative to every other site in the brain. And we did this by EC, uh, ICD, which is just a, a threshold free method for defining that kind of connectivity to every other part of the brain. Uh, and we also looked at network FC using ICA to identify resting state networks. And we expected based on our understanding of the functional role of MGUR5 that more MGUR5 might be associated with greater functional connectivity. So jumping right to the results, that is what we tended to see spatially. So brain regions that have more MGUR5 are more closely connected with, functionally connected with, uh, the rest of the brain. So we saw this uh, across controls and the AUD group, it didn't really seem to vary. Regions that have higher MGUR5 are also more tightly correlated with the rest of the brain. Um, this relationship holds if you correct for uh, gray matter volume. There weren't obvious methodological reasons we could find for why this should be the case, um, but it was in line with our hypothesis. So more MGUR5 um, is associated with tighter links with the rest of the brain or more organized activity, uh, if you want to put it that way. Um, this held across different parcellations. If we did coarser or finer separations, <clears throat> it seemed to hold true. Um, so I want to follow this thread of spatial relationships now. So we're going to come back to the alcohol and MGOR5 work um, in a second, but I want to talk a bit more about spatial relationships of um, different receptor types across the brain. Because around the same time, I had a chance to collaborate with Bratislav Mishik's group at McGill on some really exciting work they did to explore receptor distribution patterns across more than a dozen pet tracers. Um, so they reached out to many different groups across the world to solicit um, basically pet marker maps or pet receptor maps in healthy people. So these are normalized average maps of receptor distribution across the brain for a bunch of different receptors. I think I made about eight of these using uh, our database at the time. And then, um, so they basically, first of all, normalized all of these and created this really 
uh, useful library, uh, which is openly available, of average receptor maps across the brain, so in vivo receptor availability. Um, and then they use these in a series of analyses to look at relationships between the kind of receptor signature of a region and other measures, including functional and structural connectivity measured by MRI, um, cognitive functions associated with specific brain areas. They looked at cortical thinning in different disorders. Uh, they're, each of these papers is really dense and interesting and identifies uh, some patterns of receptor association that are, you know, as you might expect, systems doing what we expect them to do, and then some that are um, a little less expected and probably worthy of future study. So it tells us a bit about the kind of molecular architecture of the brain in relation to other markers. Um, the most interesting one for me is from a paper that I'm not on, uh, where they looked at correlations across regions between their in vivo measures in the receptor maps and uh, post-mortem gene transcription data. And what they found is in most cases, um, gene transcription data is not a good proxy for in vivo receptor availability. So with a few exceptions, uh, the regional correlation between uh, gene expression and PET receptor binding is really weak or not present at all. So this is the paper that I'll be probably citing in every grant application to say that you really need that in vivo uh, data that PET can give you in order to get a good picture of um, the actual function of the, the protein or the receptor that you're interested in. Um, but I'm bringing this up because this is certainly the most ambitious and largest scale I've seen people try to integrate um, molecular and PET data with, uh, with other measures. Um, and again, they have some really interesting findings that are worth digging into. I really recommend um, reading these papers and making use of these maps if, uh, if it's relevant to you. Um, but this isn't really the, the level that I work at or think on. Um, because again, we're looking at kind of the, the general architecture of the brain. We've lost any individual level information here. We don't have any uh, information about variants uh, across the different receptor types. So it becomes hard to know what this means for any individual person. So this is also true of our spatial relationships with MGUR5 and global functional connectivity. I think it's really interesting from a neuroscience perspective. It really did not tell us anything about AUD. So we did try to ask if people with more MGUR5 have greater functional connectivity. Um, we did this at the ROI level and didn't see much, but we didn't have a strong regional hypothesis here. We had seen widespread MGUR5 differences and widespread connectivity differences. So it was, it was hard to kind of target those analyses. And it also didn't seem very meaningful to kind of average both those measures over large areas. Um, so we tried a voxel level approach, which is what you see here. So positive correlations in the, the hot colors here between MGUR5 availability at the voxel level and global functional connectivity at the voxel level. Um, so this is barely corrected. It is not a robust result at all. Um, it does seem to suggest that there's you know, more of a positive relationship than a negative one, but obviously we were really underpowered to do these voxel level comparisons in this study. Um, and that's been kind of a common challenge in these studies. So we get, as with any brain imaging method, we get a lot of um, very specific information in large quantities for every participant. Um, and we were, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out the best way to combine that with other measures. So if obviously if you have a specific um, regional hypothesis, that's a, a more straightforward thing to do. Uh, there is a lot of great work out there showing, um, you know, like a difference in, uh, in serotonin levels in the RAFE and an association with activity in a specific circuit in the brain. That, that is absolutely doable and very useful information to have. Um, it was hard to go in that direction with MGUR5 just because we are seeing what seemed like global changes. So we were going back and forth about finding ways to kind of harness all the data we had um, and still be able to pull out a measurable effect. 
So one strategy that we've developed to do this kind of thing is using ICA with pet data. So independent component analysis is a source separation algorithm or series of algorithms um, that is a data-driven way to identify independent uh, components of variance in your data. Uh, so it's, it's similar in a lot of ways to PCA, um, just a data-driven way to kind of reduce your data into uh, its kind of basic components is the, the goal. Uh, so it's used in fMRI analysis to identify um, coherent networks of activity based on coherent variants over time across the brain. Uh, we don't have a time dimension here, so we use ICA to identify components of coherent variants across subjects. So just as kind of a proof of principle, we've done that with tracers that have more than one binding site. So one of these is PHNO which binds to both dopamine D2 and D3 receptors. Um, and we found that we can use ICA to split this uh, raw PHNL map component and D3 component. So this was done first by Pat Warhunsky, and then I did some work to validate it with drug occupancy studies to show that we can use ICA to get precise quantification of drug occupancy at D2 and D3 receptors even when the drug has different levels of occupancy at both. So it's really useful in being able to um, be a little more biologically precise about our pet measures. For tracers that only have one target, it's, uh, it can be a useful data reduction tool. Um, so this was a study with kappa opioid receptors uh, using this tracer that's really not very good. There are better ones now. Um, but at the time, we had this kappa tracer that uh, had pretty slow kinetics, so it was a little noisy when we quantified it, and it made it particularly hard to do voxel level analyses because it was prone to um, non-physiological values in its images. It was just kind of difficult to work with all around. Um, but we found that when we applied ICA to our kappa opioid receptor maps, we got three components that seemed um, pretty coherent. So again, we're... Um, extracting based on coherent variants across subjects. Uh, so I'm showing you one component uh, of this total image here, which has high binding in right anterior cingulate cortex, as well as insula and maybe some ventral stratum. There was another component, interestingly, that um, loaded heavily on left anterior cingulate, so those seem to be split up. And then the third was kind of a superior cortical component. Uh, so this was a blind data-driven extraction from a mixed group of healthy controls and people with depression. It gave us these components. Um, we didn't see any group difference in expression, but we did see that stronger loading of this right ACC component was associated with lower severity of depression. Um, and we could go back into the original data, pull out the right ACC, which hadn't been an a priori ROI, and see the same associations. We can get back into our physical units and validate that this is a real thing. It's just something that we hadn't identified the first time because we didn't know where to look. So ICA gave us a kind of data-driven way to use all our data to find ROIs that are potentially relevant. Um, so again, this was a small study. It can only be considered preliminary, but I think it's really um, promising. And uh, I think it gives us some good direction for future studies of this system in depression that, uh, that we really should be honing in on the ACC. So we tried applying this method to MGUR5. Um, we found that it didn't split it up quite as nicely or in a way that we could really make sense of. MGUR5, again, has really um, pretty uniform distribution across the brain. So we ended up with this component that um, loaded heavily on most of the brain. So this seemed to be most of the MGUR5 signal, so a, a cortical stradal kind of component uh, separated out from the superior cortical component. And then we got this third one that um, we couldn't really make sense of biologically. Uh, it didn't seem to be driven by you know, an outlier patient or anything. Um, so we didn't think we could go very far kind of trying to biologically interpret these components. It just uh, seems to be the structure of the system. Um, but we can use this as a way to kind of do a, a whole brain analysis by um, pulling out this, this bulk of the signal in component one, 
And then this is how we decided to look at our relationships to network functional connectivity. So I showed you global connectivity relationships across the brain earlier at a regional level. Here we're looking at connectivity between default mode network and salience network in fMRI. Um, so we know that this connection is important in AUD uh, and one that is disrupted during withdrawal. And we saw that in our controls, there was a positive relationship where stronger MGR5 loading in this kind of um, almost whole brain component, stronger corticostriatal MGR5 binding, was associated with greater connectivity between those two networks. And this relationship um, wasn't as strong and potentially was lost in the AUD group, although again, it's hard to say much at this sample size. Um, so I would say this was this wasn't entirely successful. It's still hard to know uh, at a clinical level what we learned from these analyses. I actually don't think that ICA is a, a or that MGR five tracers are the best um, the best candidate for ICA analysis. Um, but it did give us a way to kind of do a data driven exploration of all our data, and um, and we did see this relationship with connectivity. So um, just pulled out some general challenges in uh, kind of multimodal, multivariate work with PET. There are a lot of ways to do this. We explored a lot of them in the MGR5 study, but there are a few things about PET data that make it particularly challenging. Uh, one of them is that we do measure things in absolute values. So we wanna preserve those whenever we can. So this turned out to be a big practical challenge a lot of the time when we were trying a lot of really advanced statistical or data fusion methods. Uh, because a lot of things rely on normalizing images. Um, and so that can be useful, but to make things interpretable, we really want to be able to get back to those physical units at the end. So that's actually one of the big draws of using ICA over something like PCA is that we can recreate our physical values and get something like a partial VT measure um, from each component. So we know exactly what the contribution is in real absolute terms. Uh, and then kind of the general challenges here, data sets are always too small, more so for PET than for MRI, for sure. Variation between centers is high. I think that's also harder with PET. It's variation, not just scanners, but chemistry, image processing, blood analysis, modeling choices. Um, and then on kind of a conceptual level, though, there's also the challenge that PET data is really dozens of different things. So different targets that have different outcome measures that mean something slightly different different variants in noise structure. This is SV2A versus kappa opioid. Because that kind of means thinking through questions about what analysis choices are best and how, um, how you might expect a marker to relate to um, something else. Uh, you kind of have to revisit those questions every time for every pet tracer and every question. So it is uh, a challenge in that sense, I think. But overall, PET data offers us a unique way to get uh, in vivo information about synaptic density and plasticity that I really don't think we can get any other way. Um, and I think working on integrating it with other measures is going to be really helpful in building our broader understanding of brain function. Um, we end up at the totally unsurprising conclusion that we need both in-depth small studies and broader large studies with um, data sharing and data standardization uh, to kind of iteratively inform each other and build up uh, a broader picture of brain function. Um, but I do think that uh, uh, that one piece that's more particular to PET is that all of this needs a really careful consideration of what our biological systems are doing and what our markers are actually telling us in order to do that meaningfully. Okay, so that is the end of my talk. So um, I showed you a lot of work from a few different places. So my uh, kind of high-level collaborators were my PhD supervisor, Chucky Benkelfat, as well as Marco Layton. Uh, and then a lot of the work was done at Yale with Rich Carson and Ansel Homer. Uh, and the CAPA study was in collaboration with Jeff Miller and uh, J.A. Mann. But thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Uh, would you like to take your presentation off? Sure. This way we can see everyone. Um, so I started PET scanning about 25 years ago and it's interesting to see 
that there's still the same, you know, small data set issues? Yeah. And are you finding it's more that there's a lack of willing participants uh, combined with enough grant money to pay for the, the scans? Is it still that same? Yeah, that is still a big part of it for sure, especially, um, I think we're pretty good at it here, but I know a lot of centers have the infrastructure to do blood sampling and uh, really detailed quantitative analysis, but they do struggle to find participants to, to bring them through. Mm. Um, so there is kind of a hard limit there. Um, obviously, the, the expense is a big one as well. Um, but I think we are moving in the right direction. I mean, part of that is just that norms are changing. So you, if you want to just do a group difference study, you do need more participants to publish that these days. So um, at least uh, at least some funding agencies are starting to recognize that and pay a little more for it. So we're getting there. But I do think that the the solution to that will be um, data standardization and data sharing, which I also think the community is starting to get a bit better with so we can yeah, pool so our well, small data sets. And, yeah, so important. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. So if there's any other questions, feel free to either type them into the chat, chat box or raise your hand. And when called upon, you can unmute and ask your question. Thank you. Uh, Neil, yes, Neil. Hi, I uh, just had a quick question. First of all, a fantastic talk, Kelly. And um, just had a two part question. One of them is, um, I really like the work you had on the glue N2B. Do you think that's going to be a good tracer to translate to human, or should we be waiting off and holding for a different type of ligand that's more selective or something? Uh, it still has some, it has one drawback, which is that we see a lot of uptake in the cerebellum, which we didn't expect. Um, and, you know, we did some work to try to figure out what's going on there. Uh, it's not clear. It, it might be a difference between rodents and primates. We're not, we, weren't able to tease that apart. Um, and I think they're going to move it into humans anyways. Um, but I think it's, I would say it's still a wait and see at this point to, to make sure that we're measuring what we think we are. That's great. We can see how it goes when they finish the data at Yale and keep an eye on yeah. it. Um, yeah. The other question I had was about your ICA PED and ICA fMRI. Do you think that those methods could be applied to any of the tracers or studies we have ongoing here? For sure. So there's also been some work by uh, one of my colleagues at Yale um, who applied ICA to SV2A, um, which is something where I wouldn't necessarily have expected it to work nicely because it doesn't deal well when the when it's when the tracer is kind of everywhere and like really uniformly expressed. But he actually got some really um, interesting results that like line up with um, with structural networks and with uh, kind of like biologically meaningful networks in the brain. So I think that'll be a really interesting method to look at with uh, a lot of our SINVEST studies. I'll certainly be trying it. Great, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so it looks like we're uh, done with all the questions. So I just really wanted to thank you for joining us today. And I will reach out later to share the, uh, the recording with you. That way you have it for future use if needed. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time to present your research to us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.